singularity. Steve, can you please tell us how and why you got inspired to work, design, invent, and wear uh, wearable computers? So, in in my early childhood, I was always fascinated by the interplay between nature and technology. In many ways, we're all cyborgs in the sense we have uh, humans, you know, shoes, clothing, uh, eyeglasses, iPhones, things like that that are natural extensions of our mind and body. <clears throat> and so we, we share a certain uh, interaction with nature. My grandfather uh, was growing tomatoes when I grew up and he had greenhouses and that sort of thing. So I remember much of my early childhood um, playing around with things like that. Uh, my grandfather taught me how to build wind turbines and solar panels and geothermal energy and that sort of thing. And my grandfather would build Stirling engines and, and heat pumps and solar panels and wind turbines with me. And I learned these technologies of sort of what you might now call sustainable urbanism now that it's kind of become fashionable. But I, I was interested in the interplay between the cyborg self, the human, and the environment. And so I, I came up with a theory that I call humanistic intelligence. Rather than replace human intelligence with computers, um, humanistic intelligence arises by having the human being in the computational feedback loop and so humanistic intelligence is intelligence that arises by having the human being in the computational feedback loop. And humanistic intelligence is in a sense, we put the computer on people. I, I had noticed, uh, I, I mean, more recently we notice all around us technology, smart floors, smart toilets, smart light switches, smart sort of everything around us. How about the idea of smart people? What happens when you put the same intelligence on people? I thought that's interesting. You know, buildings have all kinds of sensory apparatus, but the building is an, an environment around us. I, I, in many ways, I, I regard clothing as a building built for a single occupant. Speaking of wearable computing, I know that you were one of the people who pioneered the, what you call the ITAP uh, technology. Would you mind explaining and sharing it with us what it does and uh, What's the purpose of it? So ITAP is technology in some sense that causes the eye itself, in effect, to become both a camera and a display. It's a balanced approach to the interplay between nature and technology in the sense that the eye itself um, becomes this interactional medium. And so rays of eyeward bound light are diverted through a computer system and then resynthesized as laser light. So rays of laser light shine into the eye in a way that's collinear with each corresponding ray of in eyeward bound light in, in the natural uh, form of the apparatus. But then, of course, we can depart from there with computer-mediated reality. The ITAP, I explored originally as a seeing aid to help people see better. Um, and, and so the idea, early on in my childhood, I did a lot of welding. My grandfather taught me how to weld. And a, I had some trouble seeing what I was doing, so I was interested, therefore, in creating sorts of seeing aids that help people see better, especially in, in situations where there's an extreme dynamic range between the lightest and the darkest subject matter in the scene. So I came up with something where I combined differently exposed uh, captures of the same subject matter. So in a video sequence, I have dark, medium, light, dark, medium, light, and rapid succession over and over again, and I came up with this uh, notion of combining them together, something that people call HDR imaging or high dynamic range imaging. And um, this, uh, uh, I finally uh, got that, that, that working when I was at MIT, and, and MIT owns that patent uh, for, for HDR imaging. Um, and and uh, so I was the inventor, and MIT was the assignee of this invention, which is implemented in many different things. It, it, it helps us see better in, in situations of high contrast. When you're normally taking a photograph, you can kind of position yourself to uh, get the light just right. But when you're using it as a seeing aid to help see in natural, ordinary, everyday scenes, we don't have the luxury of orienting ourselves. We have to be able to see or we'll trip and fall 
if we don't see something. So my interest was to process that image data so that a, a person could see better. So I used this for many years to help me see better when I'm welding or even just walking around on a sunny day when there's high contrast and dark shadows somewhere so that I wouldn't trip over edges or anything like that. And uh, I explored this and then I, I, I also added a lot of other thoughts to it. I said, well, more generally we have a computer system between the eye and the brain in effect. And so uh, I call this the electrovisuogram or EVG and it, what's collected from the eyeward bound light. And I said, well, this would be a good point of reference for, mod for mediated reality, something I called mediated reality. Mediated reality is a, is a predecessor of a, of a more specific case called augmented reality, but mediated reality is a proper superset of augmented reality in the sense that in mediated reality we can modify, not just add to what we see. So we can substantively uh, help, uh, help people see better and not just overlay material on top of things. Of course overlays and with a wearable face recognizer and that sort of thing are, uh, are a part of it. I wanted to be able to help people remember names and faces. I built a number of these inventions back in the 1970s and 1980s and I approached various organizations like the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, the CNIB, to try to get them interested in it. Interestingly enough, uh, they thought it was a bit too far out there at that time, but more recently, um, more recently we've collaborated with the CNIB on some other projects to make uh, devices for rehabilitation and, and, and that sort of thing. Many of our viewers are perhaps uh, hearing the first time for such device, most recently because of Google Glass. Now clearly you had about 30 years head start on, on Google, but what is the difference between your iTap device and the Google Glass? Um, well, I've not. Tr well, okay. More generally, I guess some people have, have have said this design itself has inspired some other, like this metal strip across the head with the two little silicone nose pads. Just a very simple metal strip with the two nose pads and this this mediator over my right eye. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, the the um, which we actually called glass. I mean, it's been referred to uh, as the glass eye because when you look at my right eye, it looks like I have a glass eye. Uh, when you look into my right eye, it sort of gives the appearance of having a glass eye. And the, the um, so people refer to the eye tap as the glass eye or sometimes the eyeglass. It's been referred to by myself as well as various media references as digital eyeglass, glass singular, not plural. Um, and so sometimes people call it the glass eye and other people have called it the eyeglass and people have sometimes just referred to it as glass. So both in name and in general appearance and in function, the, the, the Google Glass is similar, the same sort of metal strip across the head with the two nose bridge and the thing over the right eye. Um, I've not tried uh, the Google product um, but uh, some people have said that it, it, it seems to have the appearance or in some ways have been inspired by this. Um, They're clearly very similar and you know one is several decades ahead of the other so clearly one must have had some impact on the other. It, at least visually to me from a simple design point of view. Yeah, yeah and, and, and also in terms of the functionality and some of the things that it does. I've written uh, about 12 years ago, or 11 years ago, I wrote uh, two books on this detailing it in very extreme detail, how to build it, how it works and all that sort of thing. And I've published lots of papers and other publications showing how it works. So the community in a sense have, has had um, uh, you know, 30 years to sort of think about it and, and, and uh, 10 or 15 years to read over some of my publications of, of how it works and everything. So lots of people have built iTaps uh, over the years. And so um, hopefully this technology is, is, is able to help a large number of people. So are you happy that now a huge company such as Google with you know, enormous resources behind its back is putting so much effort behind the project so it would probably if successful, bring it into the mainstream? Perhaps, I guess time will tell. I mean, lots of other companies have tried 
to bring this product to market um, uh, in the past and, and some have done better than others. Um, there has been lots of, uh, you know, I've been asked to be a consultant on some of these projects. Others have just come uh, by and some of them have done better than others. I certainly could provide a lot of uh, useful um, insight, say, having created this world for myself and others and lived in this world for the last 34 years or so. So Google is uh, pushing also very much the, the app part of that device in terms of providing a very sophisticated augmented reality uh, that goes along with that technology. Uh, is that the future of the iTap? Uh, as I wrote in my book, uh, augmented reality simply won't work because if you simply add to an already confusing world, it makes the world too confusing for long-term use. You get a lot of headaches and nausea and that sort of thing. So a different approach, which is actually older, uh, is mediated reality or augmented reality, um, which is what, where, where I present in my book. Um, and I think that if anybody tries this for 16 hours a day, you realize that augmenting is not the direction you want to go. You've got to take some content out to make room for the new content you're putting in. It's a basic fact of life that, <clears throat> that, uh, that augmented reality just won't work. Yeah, you speak there about information overload and how you know, that technology can actually sort of tune down or diminish the information overload. So, are you uh, accomplishing this with your device or...? Yes, that's what mediated reality is. Mediated reality gives you a balance rather than just thrusting more on top. If you blindly thrust more information on top of the world, uh, there's a lot of problems that arise as I outline in my book. You become basically like an Apache pilot, Apache helicopter pilot, which is very tough. You know, one eye, you're looking at this, the other eye is looking at that. It, it takes many years of practice and to, to be able to, to do that. Do you have any such trouble between the two uh, eye points of view? Um, not really. I mean, I discuss these issues. There's long-term adaptation issues and short-term adaptation issues, which I discuss at length in, in, uh, in chapters two and three of Intelligent Image Processing, published by John Wiley and Sons, as well as some of the other papers on mediated reality. All that sort of uh, augmentation or enhancement technology, does that make you a cyborg? Some people call you occasionally the first cyborg. Uh, it depends on how you define cyborg, although the media often has described me as the world's first cyborg, as, as of some other researchers. I, I sort of don't like the term cyborg because, uh, I, I sort of don't like to use it myself because it, it's un, unclear exactly, it's, it's not clearly defined. <clears throat> In some ways we could argue that all human beings are cyborgs, shoes, clothing, and other extensions of the mind and body uh, separate us from nature. In terms of nature and technology, um, human beings in some ways are already unnatural organisms in the sense that, that they've already um, fitted themselves with various kinds of technological prostheses like shoes and clothing and eyeglasses and smartphones and things like that. So we're already um, kind of beyond that. And so I, I think it might be more relevant to say what I really want to talk about is an embodiment of humanistic intelligence. That is to say, getting us to the point where we embody intelligence that arises based on the human being and the computational feedback loop of the computational process. And uh, why not start experimenting with uh, internal uh, augmentation technology, such as, uh, I mean, via body modification or even implants? Have you ever considered uh, going the next step? I mean, clearly technology starts as an external part to our, you know, body, but then isn't the future going inside of it? Uh, perhaps, perhaps. I mean, back in the 1970s, I did a little bit of experimentation with implantable electrodes and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and I've done a lot of uh, dabbling and tinkering with different kinds of, uh, of, of internal and external technology. 
in my, uh, uh, I was asked to write a chapter on wearable computing for the Encyclopedia of Interaction Design. <clears throat> and in that chapter, I used the term bearable computing rather than wearable computing. That is to say, I used the term body-borne computing rather than wearable computing because I'd like to include uh, in this embodiment of humanistic intelligence the possibilities whether the, com whether the technologies on or in uh, the body or at the boundary of the body is sort of largely irrelevant. Um, so I think what, we, what, I, what I, I, I present there is this idea that, that body-borne computing uh, some of the technology is in, in my own uh, apparatus, some of it's in the body, some of it's outside the body, some of it sits on the surface. It's sort of, it's not too material really to where we're going in this direction, so I, I like to use the broader term bearable computing. Mm -hmm. And what is the most excited technology or innovation or breakthrough that, that you see as having the best potential of being adapted to your purposes for the next step of development of that technology? Well, I think that what we really need is a rethinking of nature and technology. <clears throat> and in nature, there's the elements, earth, water, air, fire, and idea. And if you look, every ancient civilization has had these five elements. And I think we need to really think of how we balance ourselves in nature. And I think we've already, in, in the nature versus technology road, we've chosen technology, but I think we need to bring back nature, more natural things. And so what I think the biggest sort of challenges that we face are things like living in harmony with nature while using the technology. Sustainability is important to me. Uh, you know, for example, uh, on our, on, you know, at, at home we, we have a wind turbine on our roof and solar panels, flexible photovoltaics, a green roof and a blue roof. And I'm still I'm thinking that we need to really rethink this, this nature. One of the projects we're working on now is to bring clean drinking water to third world countries and design water filters that are easy for people to build using found objects and found materials. I think the greatest technological achievement of all time is the faucet, the tap. You know, the fact that in the house you can turn on the water and get fresh water anytime you like. I think compared to the TV and, and other technology, this is a very powerful technology that has changed society in a tremendous sort of way. And I think we sort of often overlook the obvious, but in many ways we're already cyborgs and we already have interesting technologies. And so now the, the, the question is how do we build these technologies in a way that's respectful of the natural world around us and the, and the natural structure and, and order of the world. That's very interesting because usually uh, people perceive of technology as a way of mastering nature, as, as, a, as a way of sort of overcoming nature. And, and you're actually going the opposite way. You're talking about the harmonization between the two of them? Well, technology that o masters over nature is not sustainable. We're already seeing, I'll give you an example. One thing is air conditioning. You see, uh, with the wearable computer, you know, in the early embodiments of the wearable computer produced a lot of heat. Uh, and my old apparatus generated lots of heat. And my body became acclimatized to dealing with the heat. And so, um, in many ways, uh, uh, you know, when, when I was, had my heart rate checked or whatever, my doctor asked me, oh, are you athletic or, or you know, athlete? And, and I said, oh, why? And he said, well, your resting position is, is very, very slow or whatever. And I, I, I said, no, but the computer has sort of driven my body in a certain direction. And over, me, over 34 years of wearing apparatus that's running. And so the, the idea then I thought uh, uh, of the natural world and of, of one of the things that occurred to me is the excessive use of air conditioning. Like in the summertime when the weather is very nice, you know, you, we tend to dress for the weather, you know, with short sleeve shirts and short pants. And then we go into a building and it's like a refrigerator. And the part of the problem is the dress codes of business is still suit and tie. 
and so the temperature of the room is still in accordance with what it would be for wearing a suit and tie. And so I thought that if we relax dress codes a lot uh, towards summer clothing in the summertime, dressing appropriately for the weather, we could ease off on the air conditioning and save a lot of, of, of money. The, the nuclear reactors that are built are largely to supply the electrical demand of air conditioning. Air conditioning uses more electricity than anything else, and it's the peak demand in the summertime. That's when the power failures all come, is in the hot summer weather. And so uh, if we ease off air conditioning, we even out the amount of electricity used throughout the year, and therefore um, a little bit of easement in the dress code would be easement in the use of electricity, and less nuclear reactors need to be built and less nuclear catastrophes need to poison the earth. So in many ways, I, I identified um, four things, you know, the, the things, air conditioners, automobiles, elevators, and televisions as technologies of excess. Those four technologies are technologies that I generally think we should have less of. Uh, I think that uh, we can go up and down stairs as a general rule, I do often don't use elevators because the connectivity was less, so I'd go up the stairs. A nice grand open staircase gives you good internet connectivity while you're going up the stairs and doesn't cut you off from the outside world as much as being trapped in an elevator where the reception is often poor. And the, the um, television as a unidirectional medium, just watching this, is also less participatory. I think that we as humans should be creators of content as well as just consumers. Television has this one unidirectional modality that I think is harmful. And, and automobiles, you know, we can walk more. We should make the city livable so we can walk more places and get more exercise. And of course, air conditioning, we should have less of it because it's an excess that we really don't need. If we could cut back on those four things, I think that the world would be a much better place. So I'm in my in in some of my writing I've sort of I mean sort of been referred to I guess as a cyborg Luddite, you know, on the one hand embracing technology, but on the other hand certain technologies I think we need to ease back on. I believe that there can be a balance. With better eyeglasses we can see better, we don't need as much electric light in the environment. It doesn't need to be so bright all the time. You can cut back a little on the lighting. We can cut back a little on the air conditioning. We can cut back on a little, a little on the automotive wasteland that we create and the urban sprawl. And we can cut back on one directional media like television. So you think that cutting back is the solution because uh, technophiles generally say that the solution is not less technology but it's more technology, better technology, smarter technology. So in a way, technology has always been the way out. Rather than cutting back on things, we should simply invent better air conditioning, more efficient, uh, that's using, you know, solar power instead of, you know, nuclear power and so on. Yeah, I think that, uh, um, yeah, I, I do believe in solar power, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, but I also think that when we go to solar, in my house I've got solar and I've got 12 volt appliances for a lot of things. I've used 12 volts instead of 120 volts. I think if we divide the voltage by 10 but keep the amperage about the same, you know, if we had um, 12 volt outlets instead of 120 volt outlets, DC, 12 volt DC outlets throughout the home and built 12 volt DC appliances for most things, we could cut down a lot on things and scale ourselves back to what we can produce. The whole idea is being able to produce what we use. Growing up, we used to grow our own food much of the time, starting from my grandfather with the tomatoes in the greenhouses. He sold tomatoes, but at, at home we grew our own food. And, and now this idea of urban farming is very much near to my heart. I think we should adjust our consumption to match our usage of technology. And I'm not saying more or less technology, I'm saying appropriate technology. Instead of uh, technological excess, we should have technology that's balanced in nature. Instead of replacing nature with technology, we should balance it. Instead of replacing intelligence with artificial intelligence, AI, we should use HI. 
So I believe that HI, humanistic intelligence, should be used instead of AI. We, I don't believe we should replace humans with computers. Would you perhaps, per, perhaps elaborate and explain on the difference between artificial intelligence and what you call humanistic intelligence? Um, so my thesis, um, um, my MIT thesis was HI, humanistic intelligence. That is intelligence that arises by having the human being the feedback loop of the computational process. I had on my thesis committee the father of AI. Many people already know Marvin Minsky, the inventor of artificial intelligence. And many people probably have, are already familiar with AI. And so I brought him in on my committee because I thought if I'm going to challenge his theory, I should at least bring him in to defend it, so to speak. So anyway, um, he related very much to what I was doing. And he understood and appreciated what I was doing with HI which is intelligence that arises by having the human being in the computational loop of the feedback process. One embodiment of HI that I came up with was the wearable face recognizer to help people who have trouble remembering names and faces. So the way that works is the ITAP points at somebody and then that helps to, to, to remember uh, who they are. So, so it's a visual memory prosthetic, or VMP I called it. If you search visual memory prosthetic in quotes, you'll be able to find that. And this is a, a, a visual memory aid that helps people remember uh, what they've experienced. I want to be able to ask, you see a lot of things are just uh, about capture, but I want to be able to ask questions like, uh, I want my computer to automatically help me remember names and faces, and also ask questions like, where did I leave my gray sweater? And my computer, sh you know, my, 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 my mind should be able to answer that. This is kind of the silicon brain project, or the mind mesh. The idea that the, the human and the computer are inextricably intertwined and in some sense in the Adam Aranchuk sense of third hemisphere, the computer functions in some sense as this third hemisphere of the brain. Steve, let me ask you this. Uh, what is your take on the technological singularity? So. Um, I think that there's a different singularity that we see. Um, of course, I deal a lot with singularities because, uh, in my in, in in my own work, you know, even just just processing the data from my eyeglasses, oftentimes we have a singular value decomposition, and we decompose everything into its principal components and left singular vector and right singular vector and its singular values. Um, a singularity. Uh, partly deals with irreversibility. Say when a matrix is singular, it's not invertible. Um, I've looked at singularity from many different points of view and presented at the Singularity Summit and, and so on. A lot of it is hypothetical. And I'm more interested really in what's real and here and now. And I think one of the things that's real and here and now is the, the, uh, the humanistic singularity. That is to say, um, the technology, using the technology in a way that's, 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 that's meaningful, uh, apart from artificial intelligence. Let's set that aside for a moment, because that's a little further down the road. I think that AI is going to happen a little later rather than sooner. It's kind of, there's been a lot of promise of this, but I do think it's a, a later thing rather than a now thing. And in the spirit of nowness, right upon us right now, we've had humanistic intelligence implemented and running for many years now. And I think that's, to my own way of thinking, that's a more interesting direction to consider. But isn't the point of sort of uh, preparing for the future, looking forward strategically, and you know, trying to avoid the biggest hurdles that we might face as a civilization, or try to use them to our benefit, to the best of our capabilities, isn't Absolutely. That, isn't the point of that sort of looking forward into the future and projecting there, and isn't that what the singularity is all about in a way? Absolutely. We should definitely look forward into the future. We should also do forward, I think. Not just look, but do. And to do forward, um, I often, uh, we, we say instead of a think tank, let's have a do tank, or let's have a, instead of a, a thought experiment, let's have a do experiment. And I think that what we could 
do is right now this implementation of, of HI, like there's two things, uh, well, well, you know, in Stuart Brand's book, you know, this idea of inventing the future by creating it, the, be the best way to predict the future is to invent it uh, in that sense. Um, and, and so instead of looking forward and trying to guess what's going to happen, let's create what's going to happen. And I think to create what, technology is like a runaway monster. In my book, I, 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 I say, you know, you can quote this from my book in 2001, is technology is a runaway monster and the best way to tame it is with a piece of itself. I very much like your focus on doing rather than thinking, of being here and now and making a difference here and now rather than imagining the future. I, I'm very much in support of that and I get that idea. But if the technological singularity were to occur and artificial intelligence were to become a fact, then isn't there the chance that we might go obsolete, that the human race can go extinct? Let me, let me put this another way. If, uh, if, if, a te if an artificial intelligence, like, if computers became more intelligent than people, well, already, let's say, from the surveillance point of view, we already have smart toilets, smart elevators, smart light switches. What would happen if a toilet became more intelligent than people? Well, the answer is to get people more intelligent. <coughs> I mean, some people have likened surveillance versus surveillance, or equivalence, the balance between surveillance and surveillance, as, an as, as a kind of intellectual arms race of sorts, and said, well, humans need to become more intelligent to deal with these ever more intelligent machines in the environment. And so, if we look at it that way, I mean, the way I look, I like to look at this is in terms of existemology, existential epistemology. I'll give you a simple understanding of existemology, uh, which I refer, you see, when I went to MIT, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert were doing something uh, called learn by doing, or, or uh, there's this whole idea of constructionism. And constructionism is loosely speaking learn by doing and other people have there's other terms that are similar there's different areas of research that kind of allege to be different but when you stand back far enough they're all quite similar project-based learning um, learn by doing constructionism and so on are, are about learn by 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 doing something and I thought that another approach is what I call learn by being, LBB. Learn by being is the idea of becoming that which you want to learn about. So if I wanted to learn about computers, I would in some sense become a computer. And that example is sometimes lost on people, so I come up with some simpler examples. A simpler example of existemology, when I was trying to teach my children about uh, measurement and so on. My four-year-old understands pounds per square inch. So on a hydrolophone, which is an underwater pipe organ, when you put your finger on the finger hole, there's a certain pressure. And, and so uh, she knows how many, my four-year-old would know how many PSI she could stop. But then I got another gauge that was in Newton's, or kilopascals. And she said, why would you want a kilopascal? And I said, well, kilo means a thousand. And then she said, what's a Pascal? And I said, well, Pascal is a, is, a, is a famous physicist. And a Pascal is a Newton per square meter. And then she said, what's a Newton? And I said, a Newton is another famous physicist. So my four-year-old was kind of lost as to what a kilopascal, but had no trouble understanding pounds per square inch. And so I said for a moment, um, so then she said, how about Stephanie's per square Christina? And um, so then it, it, it sort of occurred to me that the existential units of measure, that is those of our own body, the inch is the width of the thumb, you know, a, 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 a palm is the width of the palm, a hand, when you measure horses and hands, you know, that's a, these are anthropometric units, and these are existential units, you're using yourself as a ruler. So I would teach my children how to count in feet, now, when they counted in their feet, they got a different answer than I did. But since we were planting tomatoes in the garden and measuring the distance between the planting, it didn't matter so much. 
if we're building a nuclear reactor, we'd probably measure it in angstroms. But if we're just planting tomatoes in the garden, we're going to measure it in inches, feet, and hands, and cubits. And these are measurements of the human body. And these are existential measurements. When you use your own body as the ruler, I believe that you learn deeper and more fundamentally. And so existential education, existemology, existential epistemology is all about learning from your own point of view. And so existemology, existemological units like inches, feet, cubits, hand span, you know, hand span is about nine inches, a cubit is about 18 inches. And so we use these units of measure to understand the world around us. And similarly, I think we've lost that. Technology has replaced these simple units like inches and feet with a unit like the meter, which used to be uh, a certain fraction of the distance from the equator to the North Pole, but now it's defined as a, in terms of, the, of, 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 other, of other units. You see, these, these original measurements were simple, and now they've become more complicated. And so I believe, in some sense, that technology has run away from us a little bit. And something as simple as measuring something. Um, but what's the best way to sort of educate ourselves on the computer, on computers? And uh, even if we do so, isn't that hopeless given our brain biological limitations? I do, our I do think cognitive limitations, provided that AI comes to be, our cognitive limitations will be infinitesimally smaller than, than theirs, isn't it? No. I think that the only way we're ever going to understand AI is through HI. I think the only way we're ever going to understand computers is to become a computer. And I think the only way we can really understand measurement, at least as children, is to become the ruler. That's very well said. That's very interesting. So, so how do we become the computer? By wearing ITAP? You see, I know what a centimeter is because first I learned what an inch is. But I think if we don't first learn what an inch is, we're never really going to understand what a centimeter is. And yet, interestingly enough, uh, for the past several many thousands of years, philosophers have failed to agree upon what does it mean to be a human. That's fine. Um, but I, I think that... Uh, I've not had any fundamental challenges to HI. I'd welcome it. If somebody wants to challenge the theory of HI, I'll welcome that challenge. But, I, but I've had, I, uh, although philosophers have had trouble agreeing on many things, one thing we all seem to agree on right now is existemology. So Steve, uh, my last question on the technological singularity, and then we're going to move to some of your uh, more recent inventions. But so does that mean that the technological singularity is not a very likely event in your opinion, or is it also a very remote event? So not very likely to happen any time soon, any in the, in the foreseeable future. I would say that um, many of these things will happen because we make them happen. And therefore the question I must ask is, let us decide how we're going to make it happen. And I'm going to say that HI has come to fruition a long time before AI, and therefore I think it is H. I think AI should be born of HI, and born with an understanding. That is to say, I think that we will understand computers by becoming computers, and therefore uh, use that understanding to to create an AI. And I do think that AI can, should, and will be created in a way that's respectful of nature. You're not concerned that the most likely path of development, at least in terms of funding right now, for developing AI is military AI. Even virtual reality gets a lot of money and traditionally has been around and most widely used since the 70s and 80s, you know, for military purposes. It's the same argument as surveillance versus surveillance. Exactly the same argument. So in so in many ways, surveillance has gotten a lot of funding from big industry, but surveillance is what keeps it in balance. Surveillance uh, is, is, is French for to watch from above. S-U-R, sur, means from above in French, and vele means to watch. So the word surveillance 
The word surveillance is a French word meaning to watch from above. The closest English translation, the closest English word is the word oversight. Now, think about the reciprocal of that. What's the opposite of oversight? The opposite of oversight would be undersight, watching from below. And if we translate that back into French, we get surveillance, S-O-U-S-V-E-I-L-L-A-N-C-E. And uh, su means from below, so surveillance means to watch from below. And surveillance is the capture of an activity by a participant in the activity. Whereas surveillance is typically cameras mounted on lamp posts and, and buildings, archocentric. Surveillance is technologies that are mounted on people. So in, in, in many ways, body-borne technologies are the surveillance and archocentric technologies are the surveillance. In many ways, HI is surveillance and AI is surveillance in the sense that you described of the military. If you look throughout human history, military technology is often diffused into, into, into ordinary everyday use. I suggest that you read my article on humanistic intelligence. It's entitled Humanistic Computing, published uh, in the Proceedings of the IEEE in 1998. If you read that article, I, I, I talk about military technologies and their diffusion into society. One technology that I discuss is the stirrup. It allows a person to remain seated on a horse. When you can stay seated on a horse, you can fight much, much better. This invention had great military significance because it allowed soldiers to stay on their horses and fight the peasants. One soldier on a horse could keep many peasants at bay. The height advantage of the horse, surveillance. You have a high up advantage, you can see better. If you want to win a war, you choose a space that's on top of a mountain so you can keep an eye on the villagers below. So these technologies, though, eventually diffused through regular use. It wasn't long before the stirrup was widely used by everybody so that everybody could stay on their horses, not just soldiers. So I look at the time scale of how these tech quickly these technologies diffuse, and it was quicker and quicker throughout history that the technology first comes into the military and then spreads out into, into the rest of society faster and faster. The time delay is shorter and shorter between when it hits the military and goes out into the rest of society. And now I believe the time has actually gone negative, where the technology often hits mainstream society first and then comes back into the military. When I invented this, this ITAP, I got a lot of calls from various military people. I gave a couple of talks, invited talks at US Army Natick Research Labs, at Hanscom Air Force Base, various places like that. And they were interested in this technology, bringing it back in to the 21st century land warrior program, um, uh, taking technology that was invented outside the military and bringing it in. So if we consider that this, this time constant has gone to zero and perhaps even negative, as I wrote, and, I, and I wrote about this in 1998 in the article on HI, then I think we can see some hope for uh, a reversalism of the surveillance trend, that is to say, the possibility of equivalence, the possibility that surveillance and surveillance will be in proper balance. Moreover, on a broader stroke of the brush, the possibility that nature and technology will be in balance, or that, as I like to say, the cyborg environment interaction space will be properly balanced. So you're, you're very much optimistic that things would not go out of hand in that way. That's, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm not, I, I would say more rightly, I'm, I'm very concerned, but I'm, I have a recipe or an algorithm or a strategy or an approach for bringing things along the path that I think we should take. All right. So, Steve, let's move on to some of your more recent uh, inventions. And uh, I'm going to zoom back here so that I can get a wider view of uh, the hydralophone. Am I uh, pronouncing the name properly? Yes. So, hydralophone is the proper etymolog etymologically correct Greek. It's a word that I made up, but it's etymologically correct Greek. I might say that I like studying languages. You know, I, I try to learn as many languages as I can because I think it helps us understand how we think and how the world around us is structured. Musical instruments 
the language of choice is Greek. So xylophone, for example, xylo means wood and phone means sound. And so in music, we have different kinds of musical instruments. My kindergarten teacher told me that there were three kinds of musical instruments, strings, percussion, and wind. And something really bothered me about that. Well, strings, they're one-dimensional solid matter, like a long, thin string on a violin. Percussion is a two-dimensional flat membrane or a three-dimensional bulk solid, like a, like a piece of wood that we might hit. So strings, percussion, and wind are solid, solid, and gas. So if I said, um, in some sense then, if I say the three kinds of instruments are strings, percussion, and wind, it's like saying solid, solid, and gas are the three states of matter. Uh, that bothered me a lot. One state of matter seemed to be omitted, and another state of matter was duplicated, repeated twice. Yeah, so then I thought, well, something is, is wrong here. Some element is missing. And, and so then I thought, well, water has never had a voice throughout human history. The earth has had a voice. All the ancient civilizations, earth, water, air, fire, idea, the earth has had its voice. The earth is the solid matter. And wind has had a voice, the air, but water has never had a voice throughout human history before. And so now my approach was to give water a voice, to make it possible to hear water. And so this, this instrument here is a hydrolophone. It makes sound from water. Super cool. My only concern, honestly, is about my technology. It is not our, my technology for recording is not waterproof. So, <laughs> well, we're going to have to change that because if we humans want to synergize with technology, it has to be able to withstand the natural environment that we're in. So, for example, if I go for a swim in the ocean or if I walk in the rain. Uh, I need to be able to function in the way I normally function. I've seen so many people with an iPhone say, oh, quick, I've got to get out of the rain because I've got an iPhone in my pocket. Well, in some sense, if, that, if the technology can't uh, work with us, then you've got to question whether it's really helping us. Mm -hmm. So we should make uh, waterproof technology? The technology should be able to withstand anything its host can withstand. Absolutely. Absolutely, I agree with that. And we should start with our cameras and microphones. Yes. Um, so, Stephen, let me ask you the, the last couple of questions here, perhaps. Um, so, was music always a love of yours? And if it was, did it come before or after your sort of inspiration of, uh, and love of technology? I think it all came around the same time. You see, I was interested in... I was interested in uh, nature and technology and the elements, earth, water, air, and so on, the natural elements have always been an inspiration of mine and I felt that water is an important natural element. North America has most, uh, or most of North America's fresh water is contained in the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes are surrounded by eight states on the other side but they're all in Ontario on our side so in many ways it's been said that Ontario is water capital of the world. Um, and sort of, we must think closely about this technology and, 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 but also the natural element that we live in, the natural elements. And so water hasn't had a voice and I thought now we've given a voice to water and, and I'm interested in using this to help raise people's awareness of the importance of water to help in some of our projects like bringing fresh drinking water to third world countries. Many of the efforts that we're trying to engage in are helped by understanding and appreciating nature and the balance between nature and technology or more generally the cyborg environment interaction, CEI. Yeah, that, that connects very well with, with both the issues of uh, 
bringing fresh, clean water to people who lack it. And as you, you mentioned, the faucet is, in your opinion, one of the best technological inventions, and also uh, your desire to harmonize technology with nature. Uh, so Steve, it's been fascinating to talk to you. Uh, let me ask you, for those of our viewers and listeners who want to find out more about what you do, uh, where is, what's the best place to, to find more about you? Well, I guess uh, the best, a good place to learn more about this work is to look at some of the books and papers that I've written. Uh, a good article to begin with is the Encyclopedia of Interaction Design, interaction-design.org, um, and the feature uh, chapter there, which is chapter 23, gives a good overview of wearable computing and dog-mediated reality and HI, humanistic intelligence. And then there's some other references, obviously, to itap.org, E-Y-E-T-A-P.org, and glogger.mobi, G-L-O-G-G-E-R dot M-O-B-I. We have a community of about 100,000 cyborgs um, exp exploring and living and sort of exploring cyborg space and cyborg logging. We think of the kinds of logging that we can have. When we write a captain's log, we write a log book. Uh, a blog is a deliberate act, but a glog or cyborg log, glog for short, uh, G-L-O-G or G-L-O-G-G-I-N-G, -G is, is cyborg logging is capturing your own uh, uh, thoughts without conscious thought or effort. If we capture our own experiences without conscious thought or effort, that's what we refer to as life glogging. So you think of those three things, life logging, life blogging, and life glogging. Life blogging is that which is done without conscious thought or effort. Life blogging is, you know, when you type something deliberately, and logging is when you write something down. So, uh, life blogging is this notion of of um, of stream of deconsciousness. Um, I think the takeaway point is that we need that that humans, that all humans are cyborgs, and that we all live in the environment around us, and we need to respect the environment around us. So I think the takeaway point is cyborg environment interaction, or CEI as I call it. That's what's really important, to keep that in balance, equivalence, to keep surveillance and surveillance in balance, humanistic intelligence to keep a balance to AI. In general, more generally, the broad umbrella of CEI is very important. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for... Uh, Thank you for having me on. <laughs>